it's what it's all about. I live for those parts. and But you've got to learn where those parts are and you've got to work them out where they can happen. And then you've got to manipulate the inputs accordingly to be able to do it. I mean, it's pointless going for a big floor tom if the floor tom goes... But... very different I might have turned another way I could actually single it down to one point in my life where I made a turn that made decided my career for the rest of my life really uh, and that was mixing a band called the Armoury Show in 1981 and I freelanced for a company called TechServe which was owned by a guy called Bob Doyle, and Bob Doyle started Digico. And Bob's been a lifelong friend of mine, but I was a freelance sound engineer working for his company, TechServe was the name of the company, in Birmingham. And he said to me, look, I've got this job for you at Birmingham University. It's a, it's a, a one-off. Just go there, there's a band coming, they need an engineer. The managers called and asked if we could provide an engineer. And the manager's a very serious guy. It's a guy called Peter Mensch. And Peter Mensch manages Def Leppard. And his company's called Q Prime. And I'm like, yeah, okay, whatever. I was on my motorbike, went to the gig, uh, did the show. PA went off about two or three times during the show. It was at the student's uni. Uh, Peter Mensch was there. He came up to me, thought it was good sound. Thank you very much, blah. Uh, and I'm like, okay, fine. And I'm standing there waiting to get paid because it was cash in hand. Uh, and he goes, are you ready? And I'm like, ready? Ready for what? He goes, well, you're on tour now. And I went, no, hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. Bob told me this was one show. This is, this is all like 11, 30, 12 o'clock at night, this conversation's going on. The gig's happened, you know. And I said, I, I've got my motorbike outside. I'm about to go home. I'm just here waiting to get paid. And he goes, well, Glasgow's tomorrow. And I'm like, well, I have no clothes and I have a motorbike. And he said, well, you better go and take your motorbike home and get some clothes. And that right there was the, was the decision time. Because I could have very easily gone, no, 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 mate, you know. I, I never planned, on, I'm not going on tour. Uh, I'm going to pay me, I'll get on my motorbike and go home, you guys can carry on, get somebody else to do Glasgow. Or I had the choice to go, yes, okay, I know it's midnight, but I'll rush home, I'll pack, I'll get the ride back into town to meet the band to travel to Glasgow. And that's what I did. I made the call and went, why not? I was 22, 23 I wasn't as old as like 57 I am now, but 58 too, so like shit. Um, so I made the call and I went, yeah, okay, let's do it. Went home, got my bag, got me, lost my motorbike, phoned one of my friends and said, can you take me back into Birmingham? Because I mean, I was about 12 miles away. It wasn't like I was up the road. I'd actually travelled. And I went back to Birmingham and off to Glasgow. I went, and I worked for the Armoury Show for 18 months, I guess, off and on doing various gigs and whatever. They did an album, released on EMI, everything was okay. The only problem is they didn't sell very many. So it kind of, Q Prime is a business. They are a management company. I mean, now they manage Muse and everybody. They, they're a huge management company. So they said, we can't continue to work with the Armoury Show because it's kind of pointless. We've given it everything we've got and it's not stuck. So it's obviously not as popular as you would hope. And they said, but we sort of like you. Would you like to come and work for one of our other bands? And I'm like, okay. They said, we've just signed this new band called Metallica. And I'm like, Metallica? I went, what's, what's that? What sort of music is that? They go, it's heavy metal. 
I'm like, uh, what's heavy metal? I mean, you're talking about 1984 now. Uh, and heavy metal was off, but it was like this new wave of British heavy metal or something. I don't know. I used to do bands like Kajagoogoo, Haircut 100, Musical Youth. Uh, and I did all the punk bands, GBH, Exploited, in the 80s, early 80s, 81. I did GBH's first tour of America. And that was, you know, it was a lot of fun working for the punk bands. But heavy metal? I'm like, mm. And I said, so what's it like? They go, well, if you do it, you'll find out. And I'm like, guess I'll find out then. And they're like, right, you start in November um, going around Europe. And that's where it kicked off. Uh, we started Ride the Lightning Tour. I think it was November the 7th, I get a vibe for, 6th maybe. Uh, and then, of course, we did all that. And uh, got to the end of the European Tour. The band said, we like, we like working with you. It's great, you know. Would you like to be become our engineer? Because I'd only ever really been a, a company engineer. In those days, only a few bands turned up with their own engineer. I used to be the provided engineer by the service company. Like I would turn up, wire up the PA, stack it, wire it up, make it work, and then engineer it, take it down, put it back in the truck and take it away. I was part of the provided service. And then, you know, certain bands started to have their own engineer. They wanted to get some consistency going with the audio. So it made sense to sort of employ somebody that had your interest at heart and knew the songs. I mean, I used to mix bands. I'd never heard the song before, you know. And quite a few bigger acts, you know, your Haircut 100s and your, your Aztec cameras and all them sort of bands. I mean, I've, I've done them as a one-off. Um, so... I said, yeah, okay, what does it involve being your engineer then? And they're like, well, it means you come and just mix. I'm like, I just mix you guys? No PA, no nothing. They're like, I thought, mm, this sounds like a good deal to me. Just walking in and mixing the band. The most favourite bit I enjoyed, all the other shit up to that point was arsehole. You didn't want to stack PA, you didn't want to load trucks. You didn't want to be working till four in the morning to get it out. And you did all of that so as you could do that. That's what it was. It's my ball. I'm going to play with it. Um, so when I was when it was put to me that that's all I had to do, I'm like, oh, sign me up. I'll tell you why they're not. They are probably a little more challenging because we know more about it now. <laughs> In the nineties, I mean. You, you just put the boxes... When we had the MT4 in the round and we put the boxes in, um, <laughs> you know, it's, God, we, there's no way could we have been covering the whole room. There's just no way. I mean, I look at it now and go, fuck, you know, there must have just been so many seats that just was like, what? You know, the high... I mean, because now even going 15 deep on a line array with fives or so between the boxes to make it split because the audience is so close you've really got to point the break the boxes up and point them to get the the, the coverage the vertical coverage uh, obviously when people are further back the box bo patterns opened up further so you, you're okay you got the cut you you wouldn't have you could block a few together to cover the distance and cover a bigger area but when the seats are so close it's hard to array it so you suddenly realise that you need a minimum of 15 boxes. You can't go, oh, well, everybody's really close. Let's only use 10. We only need 10. I mean, the accountants are going, you only need eight. They're close, aren't they? You don't need to be that loud. Yeah, but they can't hear it because we can't point it at all the seats. So we, we realise that you actually need an ungodly amount of PA for in the round. And it's not anything to do with volume. It's to do with coverage. It's not even anything to do with throw because the longest throw, the distance you're covering, isn't that far. It's just the fact that everything's so close, the boxes are so defined that you have to point them where they need to go. So you need a lot of them. So, yeah, it's more... It's more um, we're less oblivious, I think. 
I think in the 90s, we were oblivious to what was going on. I, there weren't only us doing in the round. I seem to remember Simply Red did it, a few other people did it. And I think we all sort of did it and just went, I hope everybody's okay, you know. You didn't know. You couldn't tell. You couldn't map a venue. You couldn't see where, what was. We, we were all, you know, we had big lumps of subs in different places, which must have been just, God, hideous in various places where they were so out of phase with each other it would have been. I'm sure it probably flipped around 360 places. It must have been just like, oh, God. I mean, when I think back to those days, it was really hard, but we were too... We, we didn't have a solution, really. Uh, it was a bit of a, a newer plot. We... You know, hanging the weight in a weird place in the in the building freaked out a lot of buildings. Um, engineering, the roof weights. Yeah, you, know, you go into Canada, there's snow on the roof. Shit, you can't hang as much PA because the snow's really heavy. Oh fuck, okay, that's a new thing. I've got to learn that one. But I do it. Do a plot. Everybody's okay with the weight in the roof. It snows, and then you can't do what you were going to do. Completely out of your control, you know. So um, now it. It was only easier in those days because we were oblivious. Now we understand a lot more. There are some very smart people about. We've just done um, two in Quebec. We closed the old arena in Quebec and we op a day later we opened the brand new one. And the first one was done in a 180 format, but it ended up selling so much it become down one end but in the round. <laughs> And then the next one was a proper in the round. We were right in the middle of the venue. I mean, it started off, the first one, the old venue was going to be like, we'll do it old school because it's the old venue. They're going to tear it down with the last band to play there. We'll do 180. And I'm like, oh, just a left and right PA, some side hangs and all that. Yes, subs on the floor, normal arena gig. Great, let's do that. Ah, it's selling really well. We've now sold 270 degrees. So you've got to put some more boxes around the back. Okay. It's done 300 now. It's done 320. Oh, it's done 360. Let's go in the round again. But the stage is at one end. And predominantly the subs are all pointing to where I thought the people were going to be. So I was using a company called Solatech, which are a fantastic company. I'm so enamored with that company. Um, and Frankie Dejeuner, the engineer, the, the system designer, is a fantastically clever, smart guy who does Cirque du Soleil and all these other very intelligent designs. He goes, I'll put the design together. <sighs> stunning, absolutely stunning. But he went with the TM array at one end. And we'd never done that. We'd only ever done the TM array in the middle. He wanted to, he felt we should have changed it a little bit because it did put the TMRA quite close to people at one end. So as I was mixing in the far field down here, I'm driving it, there's people a lot closer to it than, so it was quite hefty apparently around the, and of course you can't control the zones with the TMRA. It's like putting an aerial and it just radiates out from a point source. That was the design. Thomas Mundorf who came up with it was like, you know, you put it in the middle and it just goes like dropping a, Stone in a pool just radiates out. The problem is, is when the pool moves this way and the and the ripples start down, <laughs> they're quite powerful round the back of there and in the length of the room they're getting a bit weaker. So I'm going to drive them to make them powerful enough, and the bit round there is going to be a little bit little much maybe. It wasn't ungodly, don't get me wrong, because I would never do that. I would have rather sacrificed a little bit of low end in the room up there if it was going to be on, but it was quite full sounding. Let's put it like that round the back. But then, of course, we did that. Fantastic. We went into the new, um, I think it's called the video drone or something, like the new place. Um, and we went full in the middle, 180. And uh, Sorry, uh, 360. But the new thing about it was, We'd never done the TMRA with the 1100 subs. We'd only ever done it with 700s. Fucking hell. Fantastic. Loved it. Loved it. And, you know, when I'm, I'm assuming, as we tend to do now, that when we go out again with Metallica, that um, that will be in the round again. And I'm going to be going at the 1100 TMRA again. Because it was great. It was great. It was the best low end I think we'd ever had in the round. 
and it was so even and everywhere. I mean, you couldn't go anywhere, it was the same. So that was the desired effect for the TMRA, you know, was to get the overall coverage. You know, it worked really well. It was kind of surprising that the uh, high shelf on the desks at that point, which probably was about eight to 10K, I would think, thinking back to it now, was about right. And because the horns at that point, you, you're, um, oh God, I can't even remember the numbers, but they were probably quite stressed, but there wasn't an awful lot of me uh, metering about to say, oh God, you're beating the horns. There was nothing going red because there was no real red lights about it. So I probably was punishing a lot of PAs and never even knew that it was. <laughs> Nobody ever came to me and said, oh, you blew all me horns, you know. <laughs> it never happened. Well, maybe somebody will pop up now and say, yeah, you did. Um, so now they did it and it, it did it with aggression. The older PA systems definitely um, leaned towards Metallica's tone. I think, you know, when I think of the... Um, EVMT4 boxes. I mean, that, that was not a high fi PA by any stretch of the imagination. But at the point where Metallica was at that time and we were using it, it had the sufficient nastiness in the high mids to suit the songs. That 3K, 3.1K on, on an MT4 system was just like, oh, my God take your breath away some days, you'd be like, oh no. And it wasn't, it's, it was a throat distortion. It wasn't down to EQ, you couldn't lose it sometimes. <laughs> it's like, you could have had the file out trying to make the slots longer on the graphics to try and get rid of more of that, but it weren't gonna happen, you know, it was there. Um, if you just dropped into the wrong volume um, for that system, it, would, it wouldn't work for you. But it, once you found the sweet spot, it all sort of oh, just sat there. And it was definitely Metallica. Uh, it's different now. Now I have more of a, a blank canvas with the newer systems. You know, the Leo system, for instance, I mean, you have this ungodly power in the low end with the 1100. And then you have a great transition, f f the, the, the horn driver, if you can call it that, because it starts at 400 hertz. Can you go? That's a horn driver. You know? And it goes all the way through, no crossover points. The, op the difference is now I have the option to add the aggression. It's, I'm not always battling to take it away. I have a choice now. I can go, I want that guitar to be a little bit more aggressive. And I can do that. Before it was a question of, how do I stop that guitar being so aggressive? Because it's just killing me. I need to make it softer. It was all about that. Now it's about how much, how much aggression do I want? Which is really nice position to be in. To have all these toys that you can just go, well, I think I'll just make that a little bit more aggressive. You know, instead of sitting there going, shit. <laughs> Everything I ever did was out of necessity. The top end in the kick drum, the attack, was because when... Um, predominantly when drummers go into t double kick drum and it's very especially fast double kick drum not like you know slow sort of double kick pattern I'm on about really fast they don't have time to put any real weight behind each hit so that means when the beater strikes the head it goes it's a bit duller than when you're standing on it you know you when you when you hit it it's got a lot when it's it lost a lot of the clarity so what started to happen was Lars would go into the double kick drum pattern and you'd just go, you'd have this. But up until that point, when he's just playing, it's normal. But it was all this rumbling shit. It sounded like feedback. I'm like, what the fuck's that? You know, what are we going to do? So I thought about it and years and years and years prior to that, and I'm talking about when I was 17, um, a friend of mine called Bruno Stapenhill, who was the uh, one of the first members of Judas Priest, and, and he was a relative of mine. Um, I used to hang out with him, which is where I sort of got me start in the music industry. Um, 
I was in the studio with them working on a song for their band and we were talking about bass drum and he said, because up until this point it had never occurred to a bass drum, is bass, isn't it? It's not treble, it's bass. So why would you have treble involved with a bass drum? That was the, the, the school of thought at that point, you know. Uh, and then he actually said the one day we were mixing it and he went, oh, it'd be nice if that had a little bit more attack, that kick drum. Why don't you try the, the treble knob? I mean, there weren't no, any numbers involved at that point. Desks just was bass, middle and treble, you know. It's like we didn't even know what frequency was. It just seemed to make it sound that way and this one made it sound that way. OK, when well, we can work with that. And we tried it and it, it did add something. Well, that must have logged with me. Um, and years later, when I suddenly started falling into this problem, I'm like, oh, hang on a minute. If I make these things sound a little bit more pointed, a bit more click, 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 then you're going to be able to at least hear click, 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 click with some... And I thought, well, that's going to help. And um, that's basically where it came from. It was all a case of uh, necessity, um, the, the adding top end to kick drums. And, of course, it went from there and everybody sort of took it on board and it, be it became a bit of an established thing. Did I originate it? Not really. I mean, can you originate a sound? I suppose you can. I kind of think musicians originate sounds, not the sound engineers. We embellish what a musician does. You know, if a guitarist comes up with a spectacular tone of guitar, it wasn't the sound engineer, it was the guitarist. It wasn't the engineer that captured it in the studio even. No, the guitarist started this. You know, so can the engineer go, oh, well, I added that little bit of whatever to it that made it so spectacular. I can't see the fact, um, people I know attribute the the attack on kick drums to me. I don't know whether I can really fully take that. You know, most of these new sound systems are all very good. They really are. Okay, they all have their own little nuances that, you know, but once you know what those nuances are, when you go into using them, you know what to expect. Um, now, of course, when, when you hire as much PA system as I have to in very different places in the world, I could not say, oh, it's exclusively Maya. Because when we're in Kuala Lumpur, I'm not shipping PA there. We've got control and monitors, of course, but you're not. we're doing stadiums. So I can't take a big enough amount of system and move it quick enough to cover all the shows. So we rent locally. I spec the system, and it's provided by who's about. Now, that means you have to go, who's got the most of what? You know? In, you're in Colombia, Bogota. Who's got the biggest PA system in Colombia? Well, I was fortunate there because it's actually Leo. So that was a good one. Um, and Maya support me, of course they do. They're fantastic. And they, the Bogota people um, didn't have enough subs. So uh, Maya sent me out another 20 1100s to supplement the 20 they had, I think it was. So, you know... I, that worked out fantastic. Kuala Lumpur, uh, in fact, that was Leo as well. There was something in um, Argentina, I believe. I think that was a, a JBL VTX system, which I've also used. I had to use VTX in the round because the weight of the box is so light. You know, when you're hanging 150 boxes from the roof in the center of the room, all the way round the in the round stage you know it was 10 hangs of 15 deep it's 150 boxes now Maya products are never that light unfortunately because the amplifiers in the boxes but it does keep the ground incredibly clean when you use a powered box in the round when we use like with the VTX we had to have amplifier world I had uh, 100 and 96 amp channels of on the the crown v-rack system uh 
And so we had to position these in different points in the of, in the arena, you know. So you have to section off the is the amplifier world. Then you've got all this swage of cable coming down. Now you don't want massively long speaker leads because you're starting to screw with the impedance of the box. And that can filter the response. You have to be very careful what you're doing. You know, or is that section a little quieter and it shouldn't because the impedance of the cable, you know, you have to make sure you're using oxygen free cable. You have to make sure everything is just so. Everything's got to work the best it can. So we we opted to put all the amp racks. We had four amplifier stations at four corners of the arena, fenced off security, the whole thing to protect the amp racks. That's such a pain in the ass, that is. It's so much nicer when they're all in the air and you just have a signal lead going up. There you go, click. And you end up with the down leads to the floor are tiny. You've got, you might have one little malt like that that runs a massive system you know what I mean? and a power cable, a big power cable, but that's just tiny compared to swages of speaker lead. So, you know, when, whenever I can, the, the powered box thing, and to be honest with you, the powered box thing works fantastic in a lot of situations because you don't have to lose the amplifiers anywhere. All right, you have a mains distro, that's about it, but that's not as big as a load of amp racks. So it makes perfect sense. So when you say about using different systems, oh, absolutely, all the time. And I still continue to use different systems. I like the K1 system. I think that's a great sounding rock and roll PA. It's not as hi-fi as a, a Leo system. You're not going to get the same cymbal sound on a K1 that you're going to get on um, a, a Leo system. But in, res in retro respect for that, you're not going to get the same bass guitar sound particularly that you would get on a K1 on a Leo system. So there's trade-offs. They both do what they have to do. There's just a different amount of, of nuances between them. There's just a little different thing. If I could take the bass guitar from the K1 system and import it into the, the Leo system, then I would love to be able to do that. But I'd also like to be able to take the overheads from the Leo system and bring it into the K1. So it's, and I'm splitting hairs here. I'm, this is, I guarantee you that if you said to everybody in the audience, well, didn't you think that the bass guitar was so much better tonight on this K1 than the Leo? They'd be like, what? He played, I heard him, it was fine. This is down to our own little nuances, you know? This is, this is us listening to it and going, yeah, I prefer that. And that's all it is, really. I hate sound check with the band because it's pointless. Absolutely pointless. Because to start off with the environment empty, there is nothing happening in the room. It's, it's, it's just clattering around. There's no ambient noise around you other than the reflections. And it is it has so little bearing on what's going to be happening later on at that point. The band normally are playing up at that point because they don't want to do sound check either. So they'll probably play other people's songs. Um, not only will they play other people's songs, they won't play with the same amount of... Uh, of drive that they'll be playing later on. There's a little game that I play with Lars, um, the drummer. He predominantly plays lighter in sound checks because he thinks I'll turn the drums up. And then when he comes out later, he beats the shit out of him because he wants to have the loudest drum sound in the world. But he, I learned that one probably 15 years ago, you know, 20 years ago. I knew what the game was. So I don't move it. It's, I learned not to mess. Because obviously I've had my own console for many years. So I walk into any gig with the last show still on the console. Even when it was the analog domain, I had my own console and the knobs were all in that position. I mean, now it's even with the X8, it's like recall, which show do you want? I've got them all. You know what I mean? It's like the, the hardest thing about um, doing that is remembering what's changed since that show. <laughs> the, I haven't quite worked out the digital 
filing yet. Uh, it doesn't work for me, to be honest with you. I can't work out what to do. And I talk to all my mates about it. Well, what do you do? Do you keep your shows? Do you throw them away? Or what do you do? And they're like, well, we sort of keep them. Uh, and I'm like, well, I can't go back too far because I constantly evolve the mix. It's constantly changing. You know, I might change the way I plug something in. I might change a DI. I might change a microphone. I might, I'm not, I don't just go, oh, that's it now. No, no, I'm always tossing. People are always coming to me going, will you try this? What do you think of this? So then you have to go, shit, I never made a note on the show file saying, this has the new DI for the bass or this is, when did I change that? Is this song with the old settings? So you're like, oh shit. So I always start where the last show finished. So I'm walking in with a show on there already, you know? So there's a consistency there. I uh, don't use any 8-ball. Well, I'll say I don't use any 8-ball gear. I have a delay, a D2, because I like the D2. It's not... And when Midas first came out, the delay that was in the console sounded like shit for some reason. So I went, I ain't using that. So I had a D2. Um, I have an old Korg DRV3000, which does the master, master effects. I can't seem to find anything else to do that. This thing, I buy them on eBay now for like $100. It's like, I have probably, I have a selection of Korgs in various states of disassembly because the batteries go flat in the RAM and all this bollocks. It's like, because they're so old now. But I have one of them and I have a few backups and they, they always work and they do that master effect and a few other bits and pieces. Um, I don't like uh, having too much outboard analog gear. I do actually think, it's, I do have another piece. I have a, a BBE Sonic Maximizer, which is strapped across the Tom Toms, which I use as a, uh, like it's got a bass and treble knob on it basically. Uh, and it can means I can affect a global EQ change on the Toms. Uh, I don't really need it. You know, the, the console's well capable of doing all that. But I don't know, it's a throwback to me analog bit and that's always been there and so that can stay. I like to be able to, uh, if I go to use it another X08 anywhere else in the world that we don't own, which is not really happened to be honest with you, I don't think we, because we have two of them, so we ship them leapfrog. So the one of our systems always turns up. Um, uh, I wanted to be able to just go show file, recall, there you go. I didn't want to have to go, well, let's just set up the gain for the Lexicon 960 and all the, the you know, the TCM 6000. Oh, look, the converter's fucking driving too hard. Why is that so much hotter than it was on my own? Or And then I didn't want to go through setting up all this shit. I wanted to go, there's Metallica, there's the, the sound of the band already stored and recalled, you know. So, no, I don't use many outboard out pieces. Thank you.